I'm Ron Edwards uh, with ChineseEconomicHistory.com and we're here at the World Economic History Con uh, Congress in Kyoto, Japan. It's quite an occasion in that the World Economic History Congress uh, for the first time this year has crossed the Pacific to the uh, Far East. Uh, previously it's been basically held in the Americas, Europe, uh, last time it was held in South, Af South Africa, but uh, for the uh, Far East, it's, it's quite an honor to finally uh, bring this uh, distinguished group and, and uh, organization over here. Uh, so uh, ChineseEconomicHistory.com has organized a series of interviews of prominent economic historians. And today we have with us Dr. Kent Dung. Uh, uh, Dr. Kent Dung received his PhD from La Trobe University in Australia, where he worked under the uh, eminent economic historian Eric L. Jones. And currently he is a reader uh, of uh, economic history at the London School of Economics. Uh, so welcome and thank you for your time and it, it, having It's my complete you know, privilege uh, to, uh, to be interviewed by you, Ron. Well, we're, we're, we're happy to have you. Yeah. Uh, so let me first throw at you uh, some questions that, uh, that we at uh, ChineseEconomicHistory.com are, are interested in, mm. in speaking to growth and development economists in the, in, in the West. Yes. Um, first of all, uh, the, there's a general view uh, amongst growth and development economists, uh, uh, again in the West, that the general pattern of long-run economic growth is that uh, per capita income and population were roughly constant or grew slightly uh, in, in uh, what is often called some type of a Malthusian trap, mm -hmm. and at some point uh, economic growth occurred where both uh, uh, they, uh, per capita uh, income and population began to co-move. They both, both grew. Uh, and this is largely based on Western Europe's experience. Mm. Uh, I'd like to ask you, do you feel that China's long-run uh, development path uh, was the same as the West? I would say no, uh, simply because we have occasions uh, in which uh, China's population growth and the per capita income growth uh, occurred at the same time. I see. Yes. Song China will be an excellent ex uh, uh, example for that. Okay, that, that's leading me right into the, the next question. I was going to ask your view of uh, uh, the long-run economic uh, performance of China during the Song Dynasty. Uh, how do you feel in how do you feel, uh, uh, your, or your perception of what happened, and can you elaborate a little bit about that? Mm. Well, the Song Dynasty is a, a, a dynasty under a lot of pressure. The territorial size of the Song was roughly the same as the Qin Dynasty when China first appeared as a united empire. Then the empire expanded and expanded, and all of a sudden during the Song, it went backwards in size. However, however, the population uh, number doubled itself during the Song over just over 100 years. And meanwhile, the per capita income increased more than doubled. So in annual terms, <clears throat> the population growth was about 1.09%, well, as from the taxation records, right? The taxation records, unfortunately, were the only reliable uh, sort of a records of Chinese, you know, GDP. We convert into GDP, uh, and that shows over three percent annual growth. So you can certainly work it out. out. <clears throat> Population growth uh, occurred, and the per capita income. Uh, growth occurred faster than population growth. And uh, uh, I'd point out to the uh, to our viewers, the Song Dynasty was over three centuries long, 319 years long, but it seems, generally speaking, most experts' view is uh, the 
economic performance of the northern song was a bit better than the, the, the southern song, but still, three, that's three and a half centuries, or, or excuse me, over three centuries of per capita income growth and population growth, and that uh, stands in uh, stark contrast to Europe's experience prior to the Industrial Revolution. There seems to be no parallel uh, to that. Um, Correct. Next, I wanted to ask you, beyond your view, uh, I think our, our viewers would be interested in, in understanding uh, what the experts of uh, Song China uh, have uh, regarding the economic performance of, the, of uh, China during the Song Dynasty. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a consensus or are they, uh, uh, in terms of the, especially in terms of the economic growth, the per capita income growth and population. Is this very well established or is this controversial amongst Song experts or? Yes, well, um, actually everything started from two important works. One done by uh, Ho Ping Di. Mm -hmm. His view is that Champa rise from Vietnam saved the Chinese uh, economy uh, because you can multi-cropping, uh, you can multi-crop uh, rice <clears throat> many, many crops a year. And then this would you know, uh, constitute a, a, a green revolution. So green revolution provide surplus, and surplus uh, basically bail the Chinese population out of farming, and they can have you know, uh, other things, other, other pursuit. So this is a sort of a uh, agricultural-based industrial growth. The, another another view is uh, from Hartwell. Uh, his uh, major contribution is uh, China's heavy industry mm -hmm. during the Song Dynasty. So he argued that until about 1700, China's iron steel industry, in per capita terms. Uh, was higher than Europeans' um, performance. So in his view, Song China actually run a heavy industrial sector uh, before anybody else in the world. Mm -hmm. Then we have a third view uh, by uh, Mark Elvin and Professor Shiba uh, from Japan, and they view China as some sort of a Song China as a, a commercial entity. So they believe, uh, apart from agricultural performance, apart from heavy industry, commerce was important to support that kind of a, uh, you know, growth, uh, unprecedented growth. So when you say, uh, you talk about these three different uh, uh, schools of thought regarding the Song Dynasty, yeah. all of them hold the common feature that uh, there was economic growth, namely Per capita increases, uh, excuse me, increases in per capita income yep. and population during the Song. Yes. The issue is why or what the major drivers were. Well, well, uh, opinions uh, have been divided. Yes. Um, if you believe in hoping tea, yes, it is uh, self exploitation of the peasantry. Uh, you know, wanting to have more, for example consumer goods, so they produce more food and even more food in exchange for something else. So that is kind of a explanation. It's almost like Chayanov's idea of you know, peasantry, uh, you know, uh, always want something outside their mm -hmm. uh, agriculture. Uh, but I'm sorry, I only meant to, to, to preface your, 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 your comments that all three of these views do hold that per capita income and population in the Song increase. Correct. Is that, okay. Correct. So, so it's about a discussion about the mechanisms by which this happened. Yes. And uh, Champa rice was uh, in introduced from Vietnam, uh, I believe in the uh, northern Song, and it allowed double cropping where they could uh, 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 use their land and, and crop multiple uh, times and increase productivity yes. in the agricultural sector, which is absolutely key in a pre-industrial society. Yes. And that was uh, Hubbing D who, yes. who did this in, in, yes. in his book. Uh, the other one you mentioned uh, was Robert Hartwell with, with uh, 
is uh, he heavy industry studies in metals. And, yes. Uh, especially iron, iron. Yes. Yeah. And I've also heard he and uh, another group of people are, are sometimes referred to as the the Pennsylvania School. Uh -huh, which I've yeah. heard of that. Right. Yeah. Heard of that. Many yeah. people have heard of the California School, but there's the. Uh, 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 it's a little old. It's, it's a bit older, but the Pennsylvania. There was a Pennsylvania school centered with Hartwell and some other people at, yeah. at Pennsylvania, but they've. Uh, They're thirty this, years ahead of. California yes, school. That's, that's quite a while ago. Yes. Uh, yes. Yep. Um, also, I've heard that the uh, heavy industry in the Song Dynasty. Uh, one indicator that the uh, growth in per capita uh, product did not persist at least as in, in terms of as high of as a growth rate is, there seems to be an absence of heavy industry in the Ming and Qing period. Yes. Uh, uh, is, have you uh, studied this or, 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 or? Yeah, well, Hartwell's uh, uh, research was based on Chinese taxation. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same kind of approach uh, was adopted uh, later on, for example, by the Mongols, the Ming and Qing governments. Mm -hmm. But why and how only during the Song, all of a sudden, heavy industrial products such as iron and steel were subject to government taxation? I see. So this is really a question. Uh, Hartwell didn't tell us why. He only explained, you know, described uh, what it was available in the song. Apparently, this is related to a little ice age mm -hmm. during the northern Song period. Uh, the little ice age uh, affected the north part of the empire. So the northern farming zones, traditionally dry farming zone, uh, along the Yellow River Valley declined. Uh, simply because you, 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 you can try, but you, you know, uh, after your soil and after your, your irrigation, nothing would come up, come out. So the local population simply decided to give up farming. Then things start to change. I see. One group of people decide to change their profession and they start to mine iron ore and produce iron. So it is a, if you like, not a natural choice, but a choice under the pressure of, of you climate know, change. Cli yeah, climate change. Yes. I see. And the final uh, school of thought was uh, basically set up by Yoshini Bishiba, who we happened to have the honor of interviewing yesterday, yes. and uh, his uh, student Mark Elvin. Uh, and his his view was uh, the economic growth of the Song Dynasty was largely driven by markets yes. and commerce. Yep. Uh, could you elaborate in your your impression on? Yep. Northern Song uh, was responsible for the first ever uh, paper money. Yes. Um, in human history. Now the question is why. We understand that the uh, fast growth in commerce and uh, daily trading uh, make uh, the state mint completely unprepared for the huge demand for uh, currency. Copper coins. Copper coins. Yes. So they start to uh, move from metal uh, currency to something like bills of exchange. Mm -hmm long enough, wide enough, bills of exchange became a kind of a currency. And then they finally decide, okay, let's just print money. And uh, this is uh, how it happened. I see. Yeah. And did this money uh, sit in all the major cities or did it penetrate into the countryside where the majority of the population uh, resided and would have access to, to, to exchange? but money would certainly facilitate the exchange. So was the countryside affected by this monetary? Yes, because uh, certain zones, trading zones, uh, didn't use copper you know, cash. Mm -hmm. They used iron bars and iron coins. Those things are terribly heavy. You mm -hmm. Imagine you buy a house. 
you, you can't possibly move your money without you know, uh, vehicles. So um, the locals, especially in Sichuan province, decide, you know, let's forget about you know, iron bars and iron coins. Uh, let's just use uh, um, cash. That started as a revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to call it a, a, a currency, currency revolution in mm -hmm. China. And that revolution took China by storm. Yeah. I see. In the, in the following Yuan Dynasty, <clears throat> the Mongol government never issued any metal coin at all. The entire economy was based on cash. I see. Yeah, paper money. I've uh, uh, noticed Richard von Glan, a uh, song expert at uh, UCLA, has spent a good amount of time talking about these monetary zones yes. uh, with different currencies. And that actually fits uh, many other countries' experience, uh, at least large ones, where certain types of currencies are, mm. are exchangeable within, within their regions, but uh, not across uh, and so forth. One interesting thing that a lot of economists and monetary historians don't know is uh, the uh, issue of coins and paper money uh, was thought of in the court and that there were uh, fiscal debates going on in the court. And in particular, it's been shown that although he didn't use the modern uh, language of mathematics, Shen Kuo actually discussed the velocity of money mm. and understood that you couldn't just print money or produce coins and have people stick them under their, under their beds. But a, a key issue uh, regarding the uh, uh, prices was the circulation, the velocity uh, of money. And, and that's also an indication, I think, of uh, the monetarization of the Song Dynasty. Yes. Also, they realized the, the, the inevitable uh, inflation related to the issuing of you know, paper currency. So every three years, they start all over again in order to stop inflation. Yes. Yeah. So they, the, the, the Song court uh, probably was the first uh, uh, central government in the history of the world that actually uh, faced and, and tried to manage inflation yes. uh, in terms of currency. Yeah, although they didn't run a central bank. Uh, that's Without right. Without a central bank. Although uh, 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 Guangling Liao is, is uh, going to be interviewed later today, and he's, he's arguing that the... There, there was a quasi bank and, and credit available, but it certainly wasn't the Bank of England. Yeah, yeah nothing so correct. formal. Yeah. Okay, well, enough of uh, the questions uh, that uh, ChineseEconomicHistory.com has, has yep. uh, tried to promote and, and uh, uh, convey to growth and development economists in the West. Mm. I'd like to move on now to uh, your, your research and yep. what you've been doing. So yes. uh, yesterday, in a session we both happened to organize, you presented a paper called Demystifying the Economic Growth, uh, excuse me, Economic Growth of the Northern Song Dynasty. Can you uh, please tell us a, a bit about this paper and your research? Yeah, it is actually a, a attempt to build on uh, from the available information all these three schools of thought. So that would be um, Ho Ping Ti, that would be uh, Hartwell, and then Sheba mm -hmm. and Elvin. So I join three bits together and give it a, if you like, <clears throat> a logical approach to say, yes, three uh, bits uh, occurred at the same time, uh, but it's not just the surface. I want to know why. So. Um, my little contribution has been that uh, Northern Song suffered from a climate change, <clears throat> Little Ice Age. That change only affects the uh, northern part of China and also affects the steppes. So the crisis <clears throat> in that region, uh, steppes and no North China, um, create a sort of a strange um, multiple competitive state system. <clears throat> so the nomads uh, want to move south 
for livelihood. And the northerners, uh, China, <coughs> Chinese northerners, gave up farming. So in order to feed uh, the northern part of the empire, uh, Yangtze River had a minor growing revolution. Instead of you know, uh, having double cropping uh, in rice, uh, the Chinese, Song Chinese double cropped uh, winter wheat and the rice. So because of Little Ice Age, it was perfect for them to use the winter uh, sort of a unproductive season mm -hmm. to produce an extra crop. And they don't have to uh, uh, really work terribly hard uh, because, you know, uh, wheat is really not that labor intensive. That will actually support enough population in the north to dig it up wall, and then you'll produce a lot of wine. Mm -hmm. And also enough Chinese decide to move southwards to produce more and more this kind of a double cropping uh, agricultural uh, uh, e economy. So this is an enormous reshuffling of the economy uh, simply because of uh, this uh, little ice age. On the other hand, because the pressure, uh, now little ice age creates a geopolitical situation. Uh, the the nomads um, standing right across Chinese border, uh, they control the Great War of China and they asked the Chinese to pay ransom, otherwise they'll move in. And the Chinese tried to fight back, but they, they simply lost every single war against the nomads. So on agreement, they signed three major treaties with the nomads um, on the nomads terms. <clears throat> and uh, they pay ransom, a uh, huge amount of cash, Silver, in fact, a lot of silk and a lot of luxuries, not only from China, but also beyond China, mm -hmm. such as you know, uh, turtle shells and uh, spices. So the nomads start to milk China, and they took all the advantage of their superiority in, in military technology, and um, the government start to respond to this kind of pressure um, by opening up China's post, uh, uh, all the uh, you know, uh, coast, coastal cities, uh, especially uh, Hangzhou, Quanzhou, Guangzhou, and they all opened during this time. Large ships were built, uh, officials and uh, merchants uh, joined together uh, to have some sort of, a, you feel like, um, uh, or, mercantilism uh, approach. Uh, Going out, get something back, and then we tax you, and then uh, we need money, we also need goods to pay our ransom to the northern nomads. Which, I'm sorry, I want to interject here. Was, was, this seems to have uh, my knowledge of the uh, of these uh, organizations were it wasn't simply just agreements between an, an official and a merchant they actually did form some type of organization which also involved distribution and transportation and things and this yes. it was some sort of uh, a cooperative uh, organization ac actually uh, formed yes did you did you, did you uh, find this unique to the yes, the song yes very strangely uh, the state set up bureaus, uh, specialized bureaus, to handle tea and tea production, w wine and the wine production, sake that is, and iron production, uh, other you know, metals such as copper, tin, lead, um, they are all specialized. But did they, did they uh, organize that cooperatively with, with merchants? Yes. They did? They did. Okay. Also, they, so they, they control yes, they control the key ingredients mm -hmm. of the production. For example, for the wine uh, bureau, they control yeast. Yes. 
And uh, if you want to produce wine, fine, but you have to buy it from us. In exchange for your privilege, we tax you. So that, that's a kind of a very, you know, it's a, I have to say this is really the first attempt of mercantilism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the state run capitalism mm -hmm. to make money and more money and more money in order to pay uh, for their peace, you mm -hmm. know, the privilege of ha having peace with nomads. And this is a special time, uh, de desperate time, you know, desperate measures for this right time. Mm -hmm. um, and it worked, it mm -hmm. absolutely worked. Um, so I wonder uh, if that equilibrium, geopolitical equilibrium continued for another 300 years, mm -hmm. Song China would be uh, the first industrialized society in the world. I see. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, then I'd like to ask you, uh, you've mentioned uh, some future research that you're taking a, a, a look at that involves uh, some views of uh, Karl Marx and so forth. Could you tell us about your, yes. your plans for future yeah. research? Certainly. Oh, my, my traditional training, if you like, uh, tradi so traditional, it's not even Chinese, uh, from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences where I graduated from, um, was, you know, Marxism. And we have this notion or fantasy that the you know, uh, human society will go through five stages. Uh, the highest stage will be communism, uh, at, at which time uh, we have, you know, uh, autonomous, free agents organizing everything, and the state will be redundant. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this is the nomada of our human race. Uh, now, when I look at Qing China, I realize, in fact, the Qing state did similar things as Karl Marx predicted, predicted for, for the entire world future. Mm -hmm. So the Qing state tanks population very, very light, uh, we know it's about 1% of GDP. You can basically say no tax at all. So the central government taxed the economy, uh, a ta uh, excuse me, taxed approximately 1% of GDP. Total GDP of okay. the Qing economy. That's quite yeah. low. Yes. So foreigners, especially Jesuits, coming to China, they send reports back to Europe saying, this is a really strange place. Everybody's free. They can go to you know, markets. There's no taxation. At the end of the year, nobody really knocked their door for taxes. So as if you know, um, they run their, their own business without the state, which is true because the entire paid officials uh, amounted for about 26,000 for the entire empire. I see. I bet you can't run Kyoto <laughs> with 26,000 <000 laughs> officials today, right? Yet you, you run the whole, whole uh, Qing Empire uh, with this, this small and cheap bureaucracy. So I call it the vanishing state of the Qing. I see. Uh, 26,000 people couldn't possibly have controlled uh, 300 plus million people, though there so there must have been in, in some sense uh, uh, local groups at least having some type of informal taxation or, or, or something to, to to control society or something. What type of local institutions, uh, although they may be uh, unrelated to the the central government uh, formal bureaucracy. What kind of local institutions existed, and what do you think uh, that they extracted uh, from, from, from the people? Well, <clears throat> people like uh, uh, Zhang Chongli will argue the local gentry actually took over. Yes. Um, the, the thing is, the lo local gentry did not represent the state per yes. se. So they insert themselves as the alternative uh, you know, organize of society, they tax people rather heavily. Mm -hmm. For example, for the uh, stipend rice sh uh, shipped from you know, South China to Beijing to feed uh, all the you know, 
uh, Manchu uh, barracks and, uh, and, and the bureaucracy. Um, the official amount was 4 million bushels. Through the hands of the local gentry, you are, look at, you are looking at uh, 10 million bushels instead of uh, 4 million bushels. So the extra will be, uh, you know, the, the cream that they you know, group out from, from, from you know, the, the population. But the thing is, these people didn't actually uh, uh, represent the, the state. state, and it was illegal. Mm -hmm. It was against law. But why didn't the Qing officials or the Qing you know, law enforcement uh, stop that? They didn't have resources or agents, uh, you know, boots sure. on the ground. Uh, so you know, it becomes easier for them to practice tax farming. Right? This is really something uh, you know, people condemn this, you know, tax farming, run seeking, right, corruption. True, absolutely true. But if you look at the whole approach of the Qing dynasty from the fiscal point of view, low tax, no tax, right. yeah, you, you, you have to choose you know, whether you want to pay tax to the central government or you pay tax for the your know, local you know, gentry. gentry uh, you know, this kind of a, uh, go between or run seeking. Yeah, indeed, the, because the uh, vanishing state the society uh, appear to support a run-seeking class called the gentry class. Um, well, I, I, I want to continue on with uh, your, your narrative about uh, the, uh, the Qing dynasty, but there's one point uh, many people, I think, uh, don't quite understand, uh, and it's not explained very clearly in the literature. Perhaps you could... Uh, uh, enlighten us a bit. Mm. Um, uh, basically, since uh, the, the Han Dynasty, uh, an aristocratic uh, society formed, yeah. and uh, beginning in the Bay Way, the, the Northern uh, Way Dynasty, uh, this equal field system yeah. emerged where uh, military uh, service and, and taxes were traded from the, the state for uh, land rights. Mm. And in the Tang Dynasty, uh, this grew early on, but then uh, later, after the Anchu Rebellion, uh, this started to disappear. And by the Five Dynasty and mm. Ten Kingdom period, uh, it's largely described by virtually everybody of all political stripes that the aristocratic society disappeared, and that the uh, the state uh, em emerged a bit independent of the aristocrats, and that th their hold on the government. Uh, was broke, mm. and the civil examination system allowed the the, the officials to come uh, through examination yes. on a more meritocratic basis. However, in the uh, late Ming, uh, after Zhu Yanzhang set up the Ming Dynasty and had a bit of a command economy and had forced migration, mm. set up the, the Li Jia system, the local system, which he very much controlled, this slowly broke down and these gentry classes emerged. And uh, many people describe the late Ming and the Qing Dynasty as being a, a gentry-dominated society. Mm. Could you please explain the difference uh, between the aristocratic society and the, the, the gentry society? It's, it's a matter of words, but in, in substance and, and label, could you... Yeah. Could you explain to our viewers the, the difference of a, mm. the aristocratic society Certainly. and the gentry society? I yeah. think that's uh, absolutely lacking in the literature that I've seen. Yeah. And, and well, curious. I have to say the Qin uh, kingdom, which e eventually uh, conquered the old China and established a, a new system called the empire system, uh, was the antithesis of feudalism. And uh, aristocracy. So this is this That's is That's the beginning. The third century BC, the yes. first unification of yes. China. Yes. Then you have thrown back a feudal approach mm -hmm. or approaches again and again. But the main approach, the main strain, uh, was always the centrally controlled 
system against feudalism. Mm -hmm. Well, it is true during the Tang Dynasty, you have you know, military strongmen and uh, a military aristocracy running the show, but they only run half the show, the other half done by meritocracy. Mm -hmm. So you have a imperial examination system open for non-military services. So your, your, your poets and, and your, uh, you know, the liter your member of the literati can easily get into the state uh, as officials. The, the, this That's group, tongue. But this group essentially re replaced the previous aristocratic groups that had a large influence on the government. Is that correct? That the, the, there's a parallel two okay. systems. Yes. Uh, so two systems. The uh, you're saying the military. One country. You're saying the military, and also the uh, civil, uh, civil, civil examination system. Yeah. But prior to both of these, in the early Tang Dynasty and the Hong Dynasty, the uh, people have largely described as is the aristocratic uh, society where. Uh, local magnates would have large mm. influence on yes. who would be the, the county magistrate yes. or their, their officials. But this, the system you're describing more or less destroyed this, this, this link between the aristocrats uh, of the previous period and the state, uh, as I understand it. Yeah, well, the thing is, from the hundreds onwards, there's a selection of uh, bureaucrats. Yes. Uh, from wider uh, societal approach, and this is eventually be becoming um, meritocracy uh, examination system. But this is in the Sui and the, yes, the Tang yes. Dynasty. Tang finally set up the you know imperial examination system. Uh, meanwhile, they have a functional uh, military. Uh, aristocracy running a lot of places, a lot of shows. Yes. But they allow, for some reason, the civilian meritocracy to become mature. During the Song Dynasty, they simply kick out all the military aristocracy and replace system with a open uh, examination, like very modern, very mm -hmm. modern approach. Um, no question is asked. So long as you can pass all the exams, then you'll be, you know, appointed, granted a place uh, in the bureaucracy. So, in fact, we know, uh, you know, in terms of degree holders, in terms of degree holders, in per capita terms, Song China produced by far the highest uh, degree holders in the entire empire's you know, history. Higher than Ming and higher than Qing. Now, Incredible. Uh, now, now, how did this these uh, aristocratic groups in the late Han uh, and the, the Sixth Dynasty period differ from the gentry that formed in the in the late Ming and the Qing period, which many people say just dominated society precisely for the reason you. You uh, described that taxation was actually too low, and they were impotent in order to enforce uh, so-called laws. And yeah. uh, but w what's the difference between a gentry group and aristocratic group that yeah. had influence? The gentry group is the result of mutation of this open, rather open uh, meritocracy of the Song. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have uh, you know, grandfather as a degree holder, then you, you know, your father will be expected to, to hold a degree, and yourself, and your son, and your grandson. So this is really a family pursuit. But the point is, you can you cannot inherit your father's title. Mm -hmm. You can't pass your title to your son. So every generation will have to do the schooling, will have to do the you know very hard exams. To in, in order to get in, mm -hmm. so that part is not feudal. That part is not, you know, uh, it has nothing to do with aristoc you know, aristocracy. There we go. But once you you get in, then you have a lot of uh, you know, you know, influence. And yeah, uh, it, it, it's you know old boys school you know network. So you start to you know, dip in all sorts of you know, goodies in society. You can actually. Uh, get commissions from the state to build a you know, 
water dump, you can uh, collect uh, grain as taxation payment. Uh, you can you know, have a you know, local, uh, if you like, uh, surcharges, if you wish. And uh, so long as you have a you know, legitimate reason, uh, very often they only sound legitimate, right? So you have a lot of ways to, to actually get rich um, because you have that gentry status. But it is not feudal. Every generation must do the hard work through schooling. So this is the difference. I but see. the result, unfortunately, was similar. I you, see. You, you have a group of people well entrenched doing rent seeking. Rent seeking, essentially. Yes, yes. So it was an uh, um, open rent seeking society. You, yes. you, once you got your foot in the door, you were, were allowed to. To, to seek rents and married in various fronts, and uh, the uh, government, unlike the Song Dynasty, was not in the position to check you and, and yeah. worry about this. Imagine in, in modern days, you know, if you say all the CEOs of large companies must hire PhD students mm -hmm. as their, you know, as their managers, then that kind of group of PhDs and their sons, their grandsons, will continue to be hired. By large companies, that's you know the equivalent of Chinese I uh, system. See. Yeah. Okay. Well, I I, I wanted to uh, take a uh, brief tangent and and go along those lines, but I'd like to return to you, to your line of, of your work. And, uh, um, so you're comparing Karl Marx or mentioning that uh, Karl Marx uh, believed that uh, uh, society could uh, organize itself with or without the state. Yes. But he was a, a proponent uh, of a society without the state, yeah. and that uh, uh, an ideal society would just be free citizens organizing themselves yes. and so, and so yes. forth. Uh, and you've mentioned that in, in the Qing Dynasty, in some sense, that this this seems to be roughly the case. The state is. Uh, Having low taxation and it has an inability to enforce laws and so on and so forth. So, the late uh, Qing Dynasty, in some sense, was uh, Karl Marx's uh, Nirvana. It, it was the, the the free society, although there was bedlam and, and so on and so forth. This is part of the uh, free society. Yes. Now, uh, you've also mentioned that. Uh, Confucius was much clearer and, and uh, more advanced than Karl Marx mm -hmm. uh, two thousand years before him. Could you, could you please elaborate on uh, Confucian's view? Yeah. Uh, well, well, Karl Marx is really a social Darwinian uh, yes. kind of person. He believes that you need two forces against each other, and then you, you then with that clash and struggle, then you you move up to another stage. Uh, Confucius. Um, tells us you, you don't need you know, that kind of a clash, you don't need that kind of confrontation. Uh, all you need is a harmony. So you, you have a synergy instead of you know, opposite forces to destroy each other at each other's necks. Um, so he really uh, he's uh, against uh, uh, any such uh, extreme uh, uh, kind of behavior uh, in humanity. So uh, in, in that sense, uh, Confucius is a better for our human survival, N not Karl Marx. You know, he actually promotes uh, hatred. Mm. Uh, this is the bit I don't like him. And secondly, Karl Marx um, sort of a dream, a utopia in which you have no uh, sort of authority to run the show on behalf of either class or the majority of, you know, of society, uh, Confucius ideology is such that uh, you can externalize your human goodness, your biologically programmed human goodness. So he believed that humans were uh, inherently good in absolutely, nature. Absolutely, yeah. And um, so this class conflict was absolutely unnecessary. Absolutely unnecessary. This is a poisonous and it's harmful. He says, if you watch and observe uh, parents' relationship with children, you'll know exactly how to run the society. So if you run a good family, then you, uh, you can you know, externalize it. He says uh, you know, uh, to externalize a sage to become 
the emperor. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the ideal sort of a situation. So if you can externalize your inner goodness to show and to run society, if everybody does that, you know, we have, we have a, a complete harmony. And you, you know, this will lead us to a lasting peace. And also, this will lead to the, if you like, redundant uh, uh, sort of a stage of, this, uh, of the state itself. So the, did he view that the state was unnecessary, or at least ideally it would be a yes, basically, society that should be stateless? Yeah. If, if you really read his, his sort, of a, uh, sort of a teaching between lines, uh, the best uh, society was society organized by itself. I see. Yeah. So this is really a, so deep uh, in Chinese believing that state can be a nuisance, right? So during, this, during the, for example, Ming and Qing, especially in the Qing dynasty, um, it's obvious that the state gave up the monopoly over violence, right? That's why you have Taiping rebellion, you have the Nian rebellion, you have male rebellion, you have Muslim rebellion, you have a rebellion everywhere. And the, the Marxist uh, sort of historians will say, this, you know, this is, we, we, we don't have to check. This must be class struggle. Mm -hmm. They are completely wrong. There's no class struggle. It is a state giving up running the show. I then see. you have a situation like current day Libya, current day Afghanistan, mm -hmm. current day, you know, you know, you know wherever. Uh, once you have a state sort of a stepping out of the show, no monopoly over violence, people will do bad things. Yeah. So this is just something we still cannot understand Properly, so that's my pursuit, right? I want to explain why a good intention led to a mess in China. I see. Well, that's certainly a very big question. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it seems that uh, history up up through the 20th century pretty much uh, points out that we do need the state in order to maintain a degree of uh, uh, peace and. Uh, uh, social stability, uh, but but certainly there's there, there's a large degree and of amount of control. How much control you want to give the state, and how many freedoms you want, but there seems to be no debate that we need a state uh, at least for military purposes and protection and enforcing laws within the country. But uh, that's a very huge question in political science and political yes. economy, exa exactly what those institutions are and how much to give that. Yeah. So uh, if you can produce an answer, I look forward to attending sure. your Nobel Prize uh, uh, award <laughs> ceremony. Yeah. Uh, that's, that, that would be beautiful. Yeah, the, the, the thing is both <laughs> Marx and, uh, and the Confucius uh, are normative. You know, they, they, they produce a norm. For, mm -hmm. for us to follow. Mm -hmm. But from the positive point of view, we do need state. You know, don't you know, uh, uh, make, you know, uh, misinterpret my, my, my view of the world. We do need a state, a yes. very strong state. Absolutely, yeah, no. That's the positive view of, this, of our human history. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, from the logic, internal logic of Confucianism, you would have that practice of a state giving up your ruling society, which right. is really extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. I see. Never happened in other societies so far. I see. In that way, China was still ahead of us. I see. <laughs> I see. Us being the West. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, I, uh, I don't want to take uh, too much of your time today, uh, and I'd like to thank Professor uh, Dr. Kent Dung for his time for having an interview with us at uh, ChineseEconomicHistory.com. Uh, and uh, thank you, and we hope you enjoy the, the remainder of the conference here in Kyoto. So thank it's you. It's going to be my pleasure, and thank you so much, Ron. All right. Good. Very good. Yeah. And all of a sudden, during the song, it went backwards in size. However, however, the population uh, number doubled itself during the song 
over just over 100 years. And meanwhile, the per capita income increased more than doubled. So in annual terms, <clears throat> the population growth was about 1.09%. Well, as from the taxation records, right, the taxation records, unfortunately, were the only reliable uh, sort of a records of Chinese you know, GDP, we convert into GDP. Uh, and that so shows over 3% annual growth. So you can certainly work it out. out. <clears throat> Population growth uh, occurred and the per capita Hello, I'm Ron Edwards uh, with ChineseEconomicHistory.com and we're here at the World Economic History Con uh, Congress in Kyoto, Japan. It's quite an occasion in that the World Economic History Congress uh, for the first time this year has crossed the Pacific to the uh, Far East. Uh, previously it's been basically held in the Americas, Europe, uh, last time it was held in South, Af South Africa. But uh, for the uh, Far East, it's... I would say no, uh, simply because we have occasions uh, in which uh, China's population growth and the per capita income growth uh, occurred at the same time. I see. Yes. Song China will be an excellent ex uh, uh, example for that. Okay, that, that's leading me right into the, the next question. I was going to ask your view of... Uh, uh, the long-run economic uh, performance of China during the Song Dynasty. Uh, how do you feel and how do you feel uh, uh, your, or your perception of what happened and can you elaborate a little bit about that? Mm. Well, the Song Dynasty is a, a, a dynasty under a lot of pressure. The territorial size of the Song was roughly the same as the Qin Dynasty when China first appeared as a united empire. Then the empire expanded and expanded. It's quite an honor to finally uh, bring this uh, distinguished group and, and uh, organization over here. Uh, so uh, ChineseEconomicHistory.com has organized a series of interviews of prominent economic historians and today we have with us Dr. Kent Dung. Uh, uh, Dr. Kent Dung received his PhD from La Trobe University in Australia, where he worked under the uh, eminent economic historian Eric L. Jones. And currently he is a reader uh, of uh, economic history at the London School of Economics. Uh, so welcome and thank you for your time and, and it, it, having me my visit. complete you know, privilege uh, to, uh, to be interviewed by you, Ron. Well, we're, we're happy to have you. Yeah. Uh, so let me first throw at you uh, some questions that, that, that we at uh, ChineseEconomicHistory.com are, are interested in, mm. in speaking to growth and development economists in the, in, in the West. Yes. Um, first of all, uh, the, there's a general view uh, amongst growth and development economists uh, again in the West, that the general pattern of long-run economic growth is that uh, per capita income and population were roughly constant or grew slightly uh, in, in uh, what is often called some type of a Malthusian trap. Mm -hmm. And at some point, uh, economic growth occurred where both uh, uh, the, uh, per capita uh, income and population began to co-move, they both, both grew. Uh, and this is largely based on Western Europe's experience. Mm. Uh, I'd like to ask you, do you feel that China's long-run uh, development path uh, was the same as the West's? 